It looks like, does it say, we're now streaming on Facebook. So I'm on your site. You're Kevin's Paul Psychic Medium, right? Mm-hmm, right. Oh, happening now. All right. Should I click live video? Let's see. Let's see here. Let me, I think I've got the wrong view. We may have to, let's see here. Yes, let me. I can share it. Just share it like my. There we go. Now we've got it. There you go. Let me see here. Speaker view. Test one, two, three. I'm just looking at us on Facebook. And. Okay, and I am sharing on my page. So you've got that working. Yes, I, I got that working. Yay, we're ready to start. So I would like to greet everyone. Welcome to Psychic Mediums Live. My name is Kevin Paul, Psychic and Medium. And my guest today is Lisa Larson, who is a Reiki master as well as a psychic and medium specializing in pet communication. She's even written a book about it called Paw Stalking, A Course in Communicating with Animals, and it's available on Amazon. And folks, if you have any questions for us, please leave them in the comments section, and we will get to them after our interview. So welcome, Lisa, and thank you for being on my show. Hello. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. What part of the world are you in right now? I am in San Diego, California. I love San Diego. Beautiful here. I used to work there when we go out, and I'd... Uh, work with the US Navy out there. So it's oh, really it's, it's a really happy place for me to go. So I'm I'm very jealous. It's raining here because of the hurricane, you know, past oh, wow. And so where you know, are you exactly? I'm in Washington, DC. Oh right, right, right. I remember that. Yeah. I'm in Washington. Oh, no. not, not raining here, for sure. And, and we met at the um, mediumship training in Maine with John Holland and Janet No Havoc last year. And mm -hmm. I and I remember you sitting in a like a little big comfy <laughs> chair in the back. What was what was with that? That was hilarious. I mean, we were all like in these little chairs, and you were like enthroned in a leather chair in the back. And I thought, oh, she's got the best seat in the house. I do, I do. Well, I've had three upper back and neck injuries and two lower back injuries. So if I sit for a long time hour, hour and a half in one of those little chairs that you all were sitting in, right. I would have ended up with a massive migraine for the next three days. In fact, the day before we started because of my traveling, I had had one, but yeah, I used to actually be a professional musician. I was a, a guitar player and I graduated one of the most prestigious music schools in the country. And then about four years after I graduated, I got into my second car accident and uh, tried to play for another couple of years, but you know, finally just had the doctor say, no, you, you, you can't do it anymore. You no, ma'am, you can't anymore. But then again, if, I ha if that hadn't happened, then I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. So I, I always say, you know, we're there. I used to love the applause. Now I get applause one pair of paws at a time, so. <laughs> That's right. That's cute. That's cute. So everyone, as psychic and mediums, we typically are, are communicating with either the living, doing our psychic messages, or if we're communicating with your past loved ones, we'll use our mediumship skills. And they are typically different vibrations. We have to work on training ourselves to do that. Um, but then subfields are something that, uh, that you do, which is animal communication. Mm -hmm. So tell us about your journey, you know, getting to this point, because it's fascinating. <laughs> well, it's interesting. We were just talking before the show about Tarot, and what had happened is I was living in a small town on the central coast of California, and we had to help one of our cats transition. Mm -hmm. And somebody who had helped me I will say emancipate him from the people down the street. Um, she 
said when I called her and told her and that we were going to have to help him cross and she says oh I've got somebody to send you and she sent me an animal communicator that worked with her rescue and I had heard about it um but I didn't really know what it was we had thought about it and I I had already been doing tarot since I was like 16 years old and she was so good at giving us comfort and giving our cat's comfort that I thought when when that happened I thought if I could do this and give people this kind of comfort that would be the greatest thing in the world and then she and I became friends and she she found out that I did tarot and and I was a psychic and and she says you know if you can do that you can do this so I just started taking classes and I took classes from Marta Williams and Carol Gurney, who are big names in the field, uh, Teresa Wagner, who actually was very nice and wrote a, wrote a, a review for my book. And um, so I, I, it just kind of evolved and I never really, it never was something that was on the front for, forefront of my mind. It was something that when it happened, I, I, I understood it was supposed to happen. So in other words, when I actually, I used to be a, a college professor and we moved from that small town coming down here to San Diego in around 2008, I think. Mm -hmm. And at that time during the crash, I had lost my job. And that was the first time that I just never went to look back look for another job because for so many years people had been saying you know you're really good at this you should be doing it professionally and i just like i don't know i don't know and then i just didn't look for look for a job because people just at that point started calling me and it just kind of took off i it was almost like i didn't even <laughs> i didn't even have the thought process of doing it until it kind of started getting rolling and i said i guess i should be doing this I guess I'm supposed to be doing this professionally. So that's amazing. Now, did you do any uh, mediumship work with uh, people first, and then went to animals, or were animals first, and then you kind of like went to people next? How did you do that? Animals came first. I started to take some classes. At that point, I had started a, a forum so that people could put their animals on because I lived in a small conservative town. So I let people from all over the country put their animals on and I would read them. But I remember one day waking up and just hearing, you know, how you hear that voice in your head and it's not, you know, it's not you. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that voice in my head saying, you're supposed to become a medium and a healer. Hello, God. <laughs> All right. And I didn't really even, at that point, I didn't even really know. I'd watched John Edward a few times, you know, and I didn't even know what Reiki was at that point. And how everything just kind of fell together when we, again, when we came down here and moved down here. I met someone who was a Reiki master and we traded, I gave her, I helped her cat transition. She gave me Reiki attunements and then I started studying mediumship and it just kind of all evolved. And, and I, I guess that's really how you want things to happen. Yes, you have to put your energy into it, but you know that it's, it's right when it kind of all falls into place like that and it evolves on its own you don't have to fight to get there just things naturally open up doors open up experiences opportunities yes that's, that's part of this a spiritual journey absolutely and just going with the flow rather than trying to force it i mean part of my journey was just learning about the metaphysical world of the 1980s you know back in the day and just got so kind of caught up in the you know, learning how to be psychic, because that was what it was all about back then, because mediumship was done a little differently back then. Um, but I wanted to learn about how to develop myself and uh, then took a big break after, you know, learning how to use my skills and developing my psychic abilities. And then took a break to kind of grow up and live my life and then have come back to it within yes. the last five or six years. 
and really kind of like, okay, I really, this is important to me. And, and I realized this is what we do as part of a healing ministry. Yes. And, you know, I thought, oh, I'm just doing readings. I can connect, you know, with a living person or with their past loved ones. And, the, oh, wait a minute, Kevin, you need, you have to realize the importance of the work that we do. It's a part of a healing ministry. And yes. I had to get my ego out of the way and work at getting my ego out of the way because, you know, it's, it's me as the vessel. It's me as the medium between the two worlds or the vessel between the living and, um, and myself. And I'm just using my natural abilities, which, you know, I've developed and, and worked on uh, to get there. And I found out that mine is a more, I'm a natural clairsentient mm -hmm. and I have a bit of clairaudience. Sometimes I'll get a clairvoyance as an image in my, in my head. How about you? What are your natural clairs? I'm more clairaudient and clairsentient. Mm -hmm. Of course, I've obviously developed clair, clairvoyance more as, as I went along, but I, I have an interesting story regarding that. I was taking a class with Lisa Williams. I took her very, very first uh, ad, uh, advanced mediumship class, mm -hmm. and it was uh, 10 years ago or something, 2010, somewhere around there. And when she first started up her school and she had a, an exercise where she put up like this, these real quick cuts of, of visuals, just like a split second of this, 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 this. And she says, okay, I'm going to show you this. Now you tell me what the message is. And I looked at it and I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I, I mean, I was clueless until about three weeks later, I was, and I was meditating a lot at that point and stuff. I mean, really getting into it. And I was talking to an animal and then that animal showed me those quick, 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 quick cuts because I guess the animal was more clair, clairvoyant. And all of a sudden it, re I, it clicked, oh, that's, Oh, that's how clairvoyance, that's how people who are really strong in clairvoyance see it. Mm -hmm. I mean, because when I see my stuff in clairvoyance, it's just, the, it's the images, but it's not those very, very quick cuts uh, is that I guess other people see it like that. So I found that very interesting, but it was, it was a real learning process for me so that I use that when I teach to make sure that my students are very, very much aware of what their strength is. And I'm glad you asked the question because for so long I had said, oh, I can't, I can't see auras. So I was so hung up because I couldn't see auras, but then I was missing all of the stuff that I was feeling and hearing because I was focusing on what I couldn't do. Right, right. And the minute I let that go, I, it, it all opened up and I could see, feel, and hear everything, you know, everything that I wanted to. So I, when I teach, I always make sure let's, let's find out what your, what your strengths are. And then you'll know what you can practice, but even just focusing on your strengths will allow all of that other stuff to come through. I do the same thing with my students. I start my first class because it's one-on-one -on -one training. I call it the Academy of Real Magic. And I say, I do an abilities analysis at first to understand, let them understand what their natural abilities are, name it so they can actually, you know, talk in proper language so that other people can understand them and they sound uh, like they know what they're talking about versus I kind of think it's like, well, that's called this, this is called that. So I like to educate folks after doing an abilities analysis uh, at the beginning. It's important. You're absolutely right. It's important to know what your strengths are and realize as you develop those strengths that the other ones that are not your primary, other clairs will pop in like clairvoyance. Clairvoyance can be objective where you actually see the you know spirit in the room or you see the spirit in your mind. That's clairvoyant subjective. So it's, it's very interesting. People are like, oh, I'm not clairvoyant. I'm like, you know, clairvoyance is nice, but it's overrated because when you talk <laughs> to the spirit, you need to use your other skills. You know, you just can't look at them and talk. You have to be able to yes. get their answers other ways. And usually it's going to be by feeling and sensing or knowing, which is all part of that. Mm -hmm. Of course. 
it's fun stuff, but it does but take work, doesn't it? It does take work. And I wanted to go back to something you said earlier that I really um, connected with. You know, you said you took a break from, from your stuff. I did too. I, I started te I started reading, I got my first deck of tarot cards when I was 16 and I did it really seriously. I even worked on a tarot line when you, when you were actually paid a living wage for it. <laughs> you know, they actually put you in a warehouse. Um, and, and that was great for learning speed and stuff. But I took a break. I went back to school. I got my master's degree, like you said, living your life. And I find it so important, not that I'm saying everybody should needs to take a break, but at least for me, just what you said, you have to, you have to have a certain amount of understanding of the world, understanding how to communicate with other people, understanding how to deliver information in a way that people can not only understand, but accept on whatever their level is. Mm, good point. Because some of the information that you give is not easy information to give. No, oh, ma'am. And you really have to walk through some minefields. And I don't think that when I was 22 years old, I had that ability. Now, maybe I'm sure that there are other people that age that might, you know, but me, for me, I was not. And, and that was, I think that experience, not only the experience, not only life experience, but the experience of really looking at yourself and working on yourself. If you've got so many problems that you have not worked on or acknowledged, then you're going to be bleeding that stuff to your clients. Right. You're not in a good headspace to be able to do this kind of work. And we have to be fairly clear, comfortable with ourselves, developed, and, you know, have dealt with or dealing with and resolving those, those weird mental, you know, anxieties or whatever uh, that we're that are part of every human life. So we really have we have to start as a good vessel to be able to help others. And you really have to work on yourself. And part of my spiritual journey was that development. I got some counseling. I did this. And then then, you know, I then I went into the entertainment world and then started a dance company and and performed all around the world and then came back and then retired the company and then like, okay, what do I do next? And so yeah. I something to excite me and this kind of work excites me. Um, and it doesn't bother me to be on camera. Uh, and some people, and it's, it's, you have to get comfortable talking to people. You've got to be comfortable in this social media environment. You got to be able to do, you know, these kind of things. And that's why I like doing these, you know, psychic mediums, live shows to give, yes. give us a chance to let people get to know who you are. Give us a chance to be in front of, um, you know, the camera and be able to, I say, be able to explain who you are and, and what you do. Because we haven't had our TV shows as psychic mediums. I have been on television on a small show called America's Got Talent 10 years yeah. ago, but that doesn't do anything for me as a psychic <laughs> medium. So I'm like, oh, I've got to start all over again. Um, so that's, it's, it's important that we do this. Yes. Uh, doing, getting it. Sorry, I, I think, you know, that if, if you can look at one good thing that's coming out of the pandemic is that people are not so afraid of this interaction anymore. You know, I've taught classes online via Zoom and before that Hangouts and before that Uvu, things that people hadn't even heard about. Because when I was in living in that small little town, I thought if I ever get to a point where I can teach this, I want to make sure to make it available to everyone from wherever they are so that they don't have to be traipsing back and forth four hours to get to a class like I did. Oh, I know. And so I, you know, I've been teaching these online classes for a long time, but what I'm finding this year with all of this is that people aren't so afraid of it anymore. I mean, some people before they were like, oh, okay, I, I get a few people, but I'm getting a little bit more interest in it now because they're not so afraid of the technology. They're kind of being forced into it. So hopefully we're seeing some good things that can come from this. 
I think that's absolutely right. And it's, our, and it's your way of looking at these difficult situations. It says a lot about you. Um, that you're like, oh, it's really a good opportunity. You're absolutely right. Absolutely. Yeah, it's an opportunity for creativity. Absolutely. Oh, wow. It's, it's like going from Zoom streaming into Facebook Live like we're doing now is <laughs> what's like unheard of. You know, you just did Facebook Live, but then it became very cumbersome. And I thought, well, we, I'd rather us do it differently. So that's why I'm doing it via Zoom, just to kind mm -hmm. of make it a little bit more professional and we have a better control. But uh, it is kind of crazy if we don't get the technology just right. Right. Well, and I think that I think the technology will evolve because of it as well. You know, when I first started doing it on Uvu and and Hangouts, you know, there there were a lot of problems because the technology hadn't evolved to where it is now or hopefully where it will be. Mm -hmm. But I think because so many people are doing this, I think that the technology will evolve. I think that even after all of this nightmare is over, I think that a lot of lot more people will be open to do doing this online, doing having these kinds of interactions, having these kinds of classes, working from home. Look, people aren't going to want to go back to what they were doing, you know, if they're if they're doing their job fine from at home. I mean, for me, I was always working from home anyway, but uh, but my husband works from home now and he's doing everything that he did there, you know. So I, I think that a lot of it will evolve. And and isn't that part of the spirituality of this in trying to look at things in a positive way? I mean, obviously there's really bad things that really bad things that are happening right now that we have to deal with, but at least to be able to see some of the good that that might come out of some the pandemic and all of that type of stuff. Great. I always say part of the spiritual journey is we're going to have these bumps. How do we what can we learn from these things? What goodies can we get from these experiences? Yes, they're horrible and we have to go through them, but I would say get a gift out of it. Get the gift out of it and then get comfortable with what you need to do to move around it or move through it, but get a gift you know, as part of your wisdom in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I study, I'm, I'm what's called a, an alakai. It's, it's an ordained, it's through Huna. It, I don't know if you've ever heard of Huna. It's a Hawaiian philosophy. And one of the things that one of my Huna teachers said to me was exactly what you just said. You know, there's so many times that you hear these people that are the spiritual metaphysical stuff. Well, just think happy thoughts and it will come. The law of attraction, just think happy thoughts. And it's like, sometimes you just, you, you can't just think it, you, you know? And one of my Huna teachers said, it's not about just thinking, oh, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy, because that's just telling your subconscious that you're not. It's about saying, hey, look, things do really suck right now. So I can either focus on what sucks mm -hmm. or I can focus on how to fix it. And I'm going to focus on, on what I can do to fix it because energy flows where attention goes. Oh, I like that saying. So, you know, it's it's just a matter of a lot of times it's a matter of focusing on what we need to do about it rather than focusing on the problem. Exactly. I agree. Now let's talk about your book. How did you, get, how did you show them your book? Let's not my baby, my baby, my baby, Makana. I love my baby Makana. I grew up with cats of that color. That's called, what kind of cat is that? That's a, uh, I think an orange tabby, he would probably be called, although I think he was part Abyssinian. He had a very Abyssinian kind of shaped face, but mm -hmm. he helped me write the book That's after he passed. Uh, he, he passed in September, September 30th, 2017. And his and my time was laying in bed at night after dad went to sleep, he and I would have our time. And after he passed, it was so miserable. And I, I would lay in bed and I'd fuss around on Facebook and Twitter and everything. And, I, and after a while, I thought, this is, I'm just not at all being productive here at all. 
right. <laughs> like this, I got to do something different. So I got myself a one of those keyboards to put on my iPad, mm -hmm. wrote the whole book lying in bed at night. <laughs> in bed at night and i figured that makana helped me so yeah it's uh it's basically an on uh, it's a a course in community it's exactly what it says a course in communicating with animals i just went through and said what is it that i teach in class how can i offer this to people who who aren't available to take a class or they want to get just an idea of it and some people that have taken my classes have read it and they've said that it's helped with that too. And I just go from everything from the very basics of what animal communication is to what we were talking about earlier, how to deal with people, how to set up if you're going to be a professional, what you're going to need to do as far as your website and everything like that. For some of those people, those, those, that chapter probably or those couple of chapters might not be necessary for them but i wanted to give some everybody the scope of it and and i wanted to give people the scope of it so that they understand it's not about taking one class and then all of a sudden i'm going to hang up a shingle and say i'm an animal communicator because it's much more complex than that i mean i think people think that all i do is sit around and talk to animals all day <laughs> it's, it's about this much of what I do and that's like scheduling and this and that and all of these other things when you run a business sure. but that's if I could just do that that would be great but um but that certainly is the what makes it all all the other stuff worth it because when I get somebody calling me and and saying how much I help them there you can't put a price on that and and i'm you know you had mentioned something about sharing a story can i share a quick story with you please do um i had a a woman call and she said that her kitten it was about a, i think it was about an eight month old kitten seven or eight month old kitten had gotten out of the house and was underneath the house had gotten underneath the crawl space of the house and I don't usually do missing animals. I usually refer that out. I've, I've done them a lot, but I just don't like doing them. But, but this was, we knew where the cat was. And so we well, got on the phone. I didn't realize they were going to be out in the, at the hole where the cat was. She said that the cat had been there two and a half days, almost three days that she'd been trying to get him out. They couldn't, she wasn't eating, the cat wasn't eating. And I, we were really worried because that's really, you know, three days. If you get to three days and a cat hasn't eaten, they can, their organs can start shutting down. So this was a very critical point. Mm. And so as I was on the phone with them talking to the cat, I, I saw the hole and I, I, I described it to them and I saw some wires and stuff. And I said, okay, you need to clean this off. You need to pull this back. So we, the, the husband went and got some clippers and tried to get, you know, get enough space out of it. Because what I saw was this wire that was sticking out like this on the inside that the cat was afraid to walk through. Gotcha. So I had them open up a hole and, and it was getting dark so that it was really like a tense situation. And as I was on the phone, he, the husband went, got on, went in to get a flashlight and something else that I had told him to get, I don't remember. And I said, oh, I got off the phone with him and I said, okay, just, you know, go do that. I'm going to talk to the cat. I'm going to do something here with the cat. I'm not going to explain it to you, but I want to do something with the cat while you're doing that. And then the wife got on the phone and I was talking to her. And what I did is I, have you ever heard of grokking? No, what's that? So grokking is merging your, it's a shamanic thing. It's merging your energy with another, with the animal and, and looking through their eyes and trying to walk them through something. And so that's what I did. I grokked the animal, I grokked the cat and I got her to walk. And, and as I it was so bizarre, because as I was doing it, I was hearing 
the woman on the other end of the line going, oh my God, she's getting closer. She's getting closer because I was walking the cat closer to the hole. And then I was saying, I was telling the cat, can you please go this way? I was showing her to go right. And she kind of got stuck and she was saying, I don't want to do that. She was afraid. And I said, okay, if you don't want to do that, let's turn this way and let's go out this way. Oh, it was because on the other hole, they had like a, a, a trap on the other outside of it. And she didn't want to go into that trap. So I said, okay, well, let's go towards your mom and dad. Mm -hmm. So I, I had her turn around. And as I was walking the cat out, I'm hearing the woman going, oh my God, she's coming out. She's coming out. She's coming out. And it was all in real time. And it was so awesome <laughs> because usually I just hear it. You know, I hear that I've done my job, but I hear it a few days later, somebody calls me or emails me and say, oh yeah, she's doing this or she's not doing that, whatever. But this was like real time and it was really just an awesome experience. Wow, that is amazing. That's great. That's a great story. Yeah, and it's just, and that cat's always gonna be a little part of my nib nibbler, I think her name was. <laughs> so that's you using your psychic ability to communicate with an animal that's still alive. Yeah, and, and, and shamanic ability. So that was a shamanic technique that I've learned through Huna as an alakai or as a shaman. I, so yeah, so using, you know, healing techniques are all, they're different techniques, different modalities, but you're still always using that energy. You know what I mean? So what other animals can you communicate with? Oh, all, all animals. I, I, when I was, very early on when I was doing that forum, I, I spoke with a couple of monkeys mm. and one was being mean. There was a brother and sister and I, and the one was being mean. The male was being mean to the female and hitting her and stuff. And I spoke with them and I asked the, him to be nicer and I asked him to take care of her. And a couple of weeks later, she emailed me back and she sent me a picture of them hugging and, and she says they've never done this before. So I've talked to monkeys, I've talked to uh, koi fish. When, when the koi fish showed me like what it looks like, their, their parents' faces, what it looks like when they get fed and it all, it's all real warbly because they're looking through the water. And of course, you know, Dogs and cats and horses are, are the staple, staple, but yeah, I've, logged, I've talked to dog. Oh, I talked to a flying squirrel once. That one was awesome. That was awesome. He, he was, he, he was such a personality. And I asked, he says, well, you know, we don't really fly. And then he pauses and he says, but we jump really, really good. <laughs> And then he showed me what it was like to be a woodland creature. And this was an animal in spirit. This was, was a, a flying squirrel in spirit that had been a pet. And, and that's the thing about talking to animals in spirit as opposed to humans in spirit is that if, if you, when you get past all of the little stuff, they can have some of the most amazing spiritual messages because their lives are so small we're their whole lives so we get past all of those few little things you know like the little um validations and stuff but as opposed to humans who have work and friends and uh, you know they're the whole world you get past their little their little lives what their lives were and then they can go into these really spiritual messages and this squirrel was really just amazing in talking about how humans use up the land mm -hmm. how they need to they need to destroy things to live whereas he he walked me around as a woodland creature and showed how how he lives as a woodland creature and how he used what was there. And it was really a fascinating conversation. It was a fascinating conversation.
in fact, I think there's a, I, I spoke at a spiritualist church several years ago. I have something online on my YouTube channel. I have that, I talked about that in there. So you've talked to birds at all? Oh yeah, yeah, I've got some clients that have lots of birds. I've, I've all different kinds of birds. Nice. Yeah. So Why do you have birds? No, I, I love birds, I love to fly. Um, I, in my mind, I like to fly. Is there any bit of wisdom that since you've been speaking with these wild animals or any of the animals, is there seems to be any tidbits of wisdom that you can share? Uh, that oh, you yeah. Yeah, there was one cat that I talked to. His name was Harpo. Love it. And he was very young when he passed. But when I saw him, he just seemed like this huge, wise old presence. And he, he kind of put his mom and I in a classroom and he was talking about stuff and he said, and this is just the way he talked, he says, now, would either of you like to know anything further about the soul's evolutionary journey or soul contracts? What? <laughs> <laughs> okay and when he talked about the soul's evolutionary journey he was talking about just that our lives are so small and we seem to think they're so important because it's where our consciousness is what our consciousness is focused on right but it's these the soul's evolutionary journey of those lifetimes after lifetimes after lifetimes which create the which create the soul contracts we have with other people, other animals. And he gave it to me in the kind of, as a metaphor, let's say, for instance, you go on vacation to Thailand and you meet people and you have a great time with them and you, you have dinner with them and you spend a couple of days and you have a great time. Well, it's your choice to get their information and stay in touch and still be friends or just have it as an experience and move on. Right. And basically that's what, what the jump off point was what he was talking about soul contracts. If you chose to stay in contact with those people or animals, then you're creating that soul contract where you're gonna come back lifetime after lifetime after lifetime and whether those soul contracts are large, because we have soul contracts with everybody, and some of them are very small, some of them are very large, but we, we play out those soul contracts. And he gave, me, he gave me an example of soul contracts of being large and small. Like, let's say you, you go into a store, and I'm trying to remember this as I'm thinking of, of it, you go into a store, and you uh, walk out without paying. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe that's a small soul contract with the, with the person that you, with the cashier, because either he loses his job or he runs out and he gets you and then he falls down and breaks his leg and then goes and gets a better job. You know, I mean, there's just all these things that the choices that we have mm -hmm make a difference in somebody else's life. It's that, that old axiom of a, a butterfly flapping its wings and in Japan and something happening in Africa or whatever that axiom is. But, but that he, he, he went on to talk about that our choices mean something down to the very smallest choices, that our choices mean something because they affect others. And there's consequences, whether we see the consequences or not, there are consequences to our actions. Agreed. And then he talks about that as in the context of soul contracts. And of course, you know, when we have our animals, we have huge soul contracts with our animals and our, you know, people in our lives and stuff. And then, but all of these other little ones along the way, but it's, it's our choice. We have the choice to do what we do will with those soul contracts we have the choice to pay for our food or not mm -hmm. you know i would say pay for it don't let I, I obviously pay for it <laughs> now how about an interesting story when you um 
when you do mediumship, someone has lost an animal, a dog. And I have, when I've done um, mediumship with people, sometimes I will get an animal or I will see an animal. I'm not good with the type of breed. So I'm horrible at explaining. I can say a large blonde dog um, or a small dog, you know, or a dark dog. And the energy, I can get the energy of the dog. I can get the, you know, the person, the slight personality of the dog. Um, and that's come through once or twice. What's, what's a, what's a uh, typical good mediumship connection with an animal? How do you do it? What do you pull from them? Well, for one thing, the difference between connecting with doing a human connection and an animal connection is that I'm direct, I'm connecting directly. You know, I get, the, I get the name, I get the age, I get a picture. And it, a lot of it is, it, I mean, it's that, I mean, it's getting the energy of the animal and having that conversation but what's interesting to me is that there are a lot of times for me that, for instance, an animal will bring a human through before they will let me talk to them. Mm. So in other words, like there was this one time I was talking, somebody called me to talk to her dog in spirit. Right. But as I was meditating and getting ready for the, the session, I got this flash of there had been a fire and somebody walked away and was okay. Or somebody was okay. That's all I knew. There was a fire and somebody was okay. So when I called her, I said, I don't know if this has anything to do with you because it was right when I was connecting and everything else, but I have to tell you this doesn't mean anything to you. And she says, oh my God. She said, three weeks ago, my sister's car caught fire and she walked away miraculously. She should have been killed. Mm -hmm. She walked away miraculously. And immediately as, as she was saying it, her father started coming through. So I, I asked her, I said, you know, I know this is a, a reading for your dog. Do you, would you like to hear from your father? And she was going, oh my God, I didn't even know I could hear my, from my parents. <laughs> you know, she, somehow she knew that she could hear from her animal on the other side, but she didn't know she could hear from humans on the other side. So I did the mediumship reading and basically her father wanted to come through and say, that he was the one that helped his, her sister walk away from the accident. Hmm. And then once we got through that, then the dog let me talk to him. So it was like, I felt the dog brought through the parents because that's what she really needed to hear. Oh, yeah. and now that's an unusual circumstance that I just happened to see, talk about. But like I say, mostly a, 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 a typical, mediumship reading with an animal How's that? Is, is going to be giving it, not so much different in some ways than a human mediumship reading it's except that like i say you can go a little farther is you're giving them evidence you're i'm 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 i always want to get the personality what i call the caninality or the felinality or the aviality I want to get that ality, animality for them because that's what usually really helps them know I'm talking to their animal. You're painting them back to life. Yes, I'm painting them back to life. And then a typical spirit session will be, and again, everything's going to be different for each can, uh, animal, but they, they will probably take me through their life because they want they're, they want their mom or dad to remember the happy moments because most of the time they're going to be focused on just the time they passed. Right. And for animals, that while that little time, that few days or that few weeks or that few months, they is very significant in their lives. It's still like this much part of their lives if they've had if they're 15, 16, 18 right. years old. 
and they want to they usually want me to start off by they usually want to start off by showing me something humorous so that I can help their people laugh and get them into a light state of mind. And once they do that, they kind of walk me through their lives so that I can give them little validations of what their lives was, what their lives were like, right. what their animal and, the, and, and their, their pet parent was like. And so a lot of times it gets very personal because I'll have to go through divorces and sure. job changes and house changes and stuff like that. So it can get very personal, but then they'll walk me through. Sometimes we will go through, I mean, obviously a lot of people will want to go through was, was, was this the right time? And did I, did I pull the trigger too soon? Did I wait too long? What, whatever it is. And so we might want to look at that transition period. Mm -hmm. um, but, but usually I try to leave it on, on a note that's uplifting for them so that they can, or the animals do, that they can feel better. And again, can I share a little story with you that I just thought of while I was talking? Of course, people love those stories and I do too. Um, I worked with this dog for probably eight years. She was the dog of a monk. And he had never had really a connection with animals before he, she came into his life. And, and I pretty much lived their whole lives, you know, worked with them her whole life from that point on. When I think she was about two and then she passed when she was about eight. And it, to the point where I was, he had never heard the, ever, never thought of himself as her daddy until I said, daddy to him mm. and so at one point she he, he had called and said oh my gosh she has cancer and we thought she only had a couple of months but we went another year and four months or something I mean she just went on and on and on and about four months before she passed she, we had a conversation conversation and she wanted to really start preparing him and telling him, this is what I want when I leave. And because he was a monk and all of the other brothers in the, um, it's the self-realization center. I don't know if you guys have that out here, but out there, but it's pretty well known out here, uh, were, were her family. Mm -hmm. They, she felt like all of these brothers that would take care of her when he was on a trip or something like that, that they were her family as well. And she made the point that she wanted to have when she left, she wanted a ceremony like they give humans. Mm. Like, a, because he always, as a monk, he always does these funerals, memorials and everything like that. So he asked me if I would distantly connect with her during the transition, which some people do, and that's part of what I do. I'm not there in this place, but I'm connecting with her. I start with giving her, giving Reiki and talking to her, walking her through it. And, and they had somebody there texting me saying, okay, the, the vet is here. The vet is ready to give the first shot. The vet's ready to give the second shot. Gotcha. And it was so, I'm hopefully I can say this without choking up. It was so beautiful. I saw all the monks standing around as at exactly what she wanted. Mm -hmm. I, ke I kept seeing, um, I think I was seeing pink roses and it was later confirmed to me that there were white and red rose petals that they had sprinkled around her, which would obviously I saw as pink. And I saw them, I, to me, what, I, what it looked like to me was, you know how like those things that you carry somebody like in India where you have the, the stretchers and they carry them over their heads? Right, right, right. 
I, it looked to me like that. And he confirmed it wasn't exactly that he confirmed that he, they had her on a, a very special cloth and all the monks each took a, a side of it and carried her out like that. And mm. after she left, I, you know, I helped her so that I, I helped her get to just that moment of the light. And then she popped over to the light and then she started just dictating to me. And I just, I just started typing and it was just this amazing message. I mean, clearly the guy was a monk. The dog came to him for a reason. She was really, really spiritual. It was just this amazing message. And it was just so beautiful that, that he did for her exactly what she had asked for. And I still, and I still talk to her once a year around that same time, around the time she died or the time of her birthday, whatever. Wow, that's a great story. Let's see what kind of questions we've got for you. Let's see here. Al Alicia Alariste says, love you, Lisa. Love you, Alicia. <laughs> Audrey Moorhead. Hi, Lisa. Hi. Terrence is here too. Ah, oh, Terrence. Terrence is in my book. Oh. Terrence is, is a big part of my, my career. Terrence was in a, yeah, Terrence was in a, a no kill shelter and, and they kept saying she, he was about to be killed and uh, Audrey called me and said, you got to talk to this dog. Is, is he going to be okay to adopt? And he's going, of course I'm aggressive. They're going to kill me. I said, go get her, you know, get go get out of here. <laughs> yeah. And so Audrey got a, got somebody to pull him for her. She got up there, he jumped into her car and they've been best buddies ever since. Terrence is a great dog. <laughs> and he, and he named himself Terrence and he named himself Terrence in that, in that uh, reading. <laughs> great. Susan Ream Westhoff says, Lisa is amazing. Oh, you're so sweet, sweetie. These are all your peeps. Yeah, uh, these are all peeps. Danny, so oh, Jenny says, I'm, let's see here. Edgar says, hello. He's a friend of mine. Um, let's see here. All these people, all right. Bel Belinda Fenn says, you got that right. I love working from home. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see. Lisa wrote about my dog, Terrence, on pages 106 and 107 in her book. There you go. <laughs> Terrence, uh, actually 106 and 107, there's actually even a picture of Terrence. Terrence and Audrey right there. There's Terrence and Audrey. Oh, nice. Yeah, I can see that dog. It's like, get me the hell out of there. Yep. Let's see here. Leslie Rogers, Newcomb. Hello, Kevin and Lisa. Um, Hi, Leslie. Let's see. Let's see if there's a question. So I saw a couple of questions. Leslie Rogers, Newcomb says, so human spirits can be connected to a live animal or animal spirits? Connected to? Oh, yeah, of course. I'm not sure I exactly understand the question. She says but, human spirits can be connected to a live animal. So our spirits, maybe you're talking about that pack. Um, there's a connection. Spirit, humans can, humans be connected to live animals or animal spirits. I. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna take a shot in the dark here. Yeah, I, it, it, for me, energy is energy is energy is energy. Once we get over onto the other side, there's no, there's no species, there's no age, there's no gender. The only thing about us is that we are encumbered with this physical body but we're still that energy. So the energy that we have here is not divided. There's no dividing line between energy. And that's another thing I learned from Harpo. There's no dividing line for, in energy. So you can't walk into a room and say, okay, you air stay over there and you air stay over there. Energy is everywhere. So really the only thing that, that differs between us and spirit, whether it's human or animal on the other side, is that we are 
are working through that consciousness in this particular human or this particular body, human or animal, at any given point. And we are absolutely connected. And I had a, I spoke with a dog once who I said, somebody asked, who were you met by? And normally they will just show me, I was met by this animal or I was met by this person. But this dog said, you know, we, I was met by every single soul I've ever seen, uh, every, ever loved in every lifetime I've ever lived. And I, and he showed me just this sea of souls. Wow. Wouldn't that be nice? And it was beautiful. And then he said, and I'm connected to you talking to his mom. I'm connected to you through that love. So you're connected to every soul I've ever loved. And I in turn am connected to all of the souls that you have ever loved in every lifetime that you've ever lived. So he, he, he it was about that connection. I mean, that was the, the message of, that was the lesson that he was teaching us is that everything is connected and it's all connected through that love that we have through one another. Mm, yeah, it all comes back to love, that important emotion. Uh, let's see. Ellen Jane says, I feel my grandmother comes to visit as a bird. Oh, absolutely. I've, had, I've seen my dad come and visit or either visit or send as a hawk that was sitting right outside my window. But yeah, it's anytime you look at something and you immediately think of your grandmother or your pet or, or whoever it is that you lost, it doesn't necessarily that mean that they're inhabiting that animal or that, that, that symbol, whatever it is that you're seeing, but it does mean that they've at least sent that bird to you or that butterfly or the dragonfly or whatever it is and but you would always know because the minute you, you it's like you look at it and the minute you look at it you, you think of that person or that animal right i like that yeah i say when people ask me oh, my mother's a butterfly no no your mother's not a butterfly she, but i like the fact that you know the butterfly was inspired by the spirit or sent by the spirit or yeah. somehow magically especially when you think of it, uh, brought into your vision. But no, they, are, they didn't become butterfly for that time being. So I, I, I agree with you on that one. Um, let's see, do we have any other questions here? I don't see any other specific questions. Let's tell everybody about how they contact you and what services that you offer. Um, so my website is pausetalk.net. That's P-A-W-S-T-A-L-K.net. Mm -hmm. And obviously animal communication. I do healing sessions. And my healing sessions are not only Reiki. I am a Reiki master, but I'm also a shaman. So I do a combination of healing techniques whatever happens to be appropriate at that time. I always start with Reiki and start with a couple of uh, shamanic techniques and then whatever is appropriate. Uh, I help animals transition as I talked about with the, the, the monk, the monk's dog. Um, so yeah, animals, I, I basically talk to animals about behavioral problems. I, animals and spirit is my specialty. I love, 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 love talking to animals and spirit. I don't do missing animals unless they've been gone a while and you're not actively looking or unless you're an a active client of mine. Sure. Um, just, it's very emotional and I'm very empathic person you have to have a you have to have nerves of steel to to deal with missing animals i did it for a long time but decided not to do that but uh yeah animals and spirit behavioral problems getting getting kittens out of out from under <laughs> out from under the, the crawl space of a house who knew you know <laughs> um and then of course i do mediumship as well i'm, I'm a psychic medium as well so and i do tarot i do tarot sessions right. excellent and i do classes and you so i teach, teach yeah i you... teach animal communication classes i teach tarot classes i teach mediumship uh teach huna 
Huna, yeah, is uh, I do Huna classes. So in in like I say, not many people know what that is, but it's a great philosophy because it's 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 metaphysical, but it, you keep your feet on the ground. It's not just out there with the crystals. Right, right, right. The woo woo, as uh, Janet. Yeah. Woo woo. And they can go through your website or your Facebook page. And I'm going to put that in the, the title, those links to your pages as well. Perfect. And Perfect. for me, everyone, if, if people don't know me, I'm um, on Facebook, obviously, Kevin Paul Psychic Medium. And then my website is where I list all my services, all of the different things I do from abilities analysis to psychic readings, mediumship readings, and then my one-on-one -on -one training, which is I call the Academy of Real Magic with M-A, you know, G-I-C-K rather than, you know, the old pull a rabbit out of the hat, teaching how students to understand what their abilities are, what's the language that comes with that, how to develop it, because it does take homework. Let me tell you, it does take homework. And then doing it on demand. Um, and I love to teach people and kind of get them started on their journey because they can start with me and then you're going to go to the other places and other, you know, tutors and instructors. And just kind of like a like elementary school, getting people started and then kind of shoving in the right direction. But I definitely have folks in my school that are interested in animal communication. I'm going to have them pick up your book and read that as part of their assignment because I think it's that, really fabulous. Thank you. Absolutely, you can get it on uh, Amazon.com, right? Yeah, and and the e there's ebook available on Apple Books as well. Excellent. So ebook is Amazon and Amazon is print and ebook and Apple is uh, is ebook. But yeah, I, I agree with you. I love getting people started on their journeys. I love mentoring people on their journeys. That's to, to when they're first to me, when they're first starting to understand all this stuff and they're so excited and but they don't know what direction to go that just to me is just the funnest thing ever it's fun we're like the elementary school teachers for this stuff right it's great yeah. i love it i love it too and, and i enjoy it and I'm, i've been to arthur fenley college in in england and that's like you know it's not elementary school it's 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 pretty intense but amazing experience and it's part of our journey is continuing education and going off in this tangent or checking out that, um, keeping up our skills because, you know, you may have all these wonderful abilities, but unless you practice and understand, you know, the different techniques that work for you and practice and learn your imagery, you know, it's not going to serve you very well. So it does take a lot of work, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Absolutely. Absolutely. But it's, it's, it's a journey that's fun to go on and it kind of goes back to what we were talking about before, not forcing it, not taking one class and then all of a sudden thinking, well, I can just jump in and, and, and be a professional at this, but enjoying the journey of learning to exactly. the point of people telling you, you really should be doing this and you're not even getting there yet. You know right. what I mean? That's, that's when you know you're ready. And um, Prairie, Griffith, someone that I know, how does one communicate with an animal? I think it's the best way is to read your book, right? Uh, is to, <laughs> but first, you have to develop your psychic and mediumship skills, your clairaudience, your clairvoyance, your clairsentience, um, because you're still using those skills to gather the information and to communicate. And then you have to learn, you know, the, the specifics of of you know doing it with animals and i think your book would be a great primer prairie uh check out yeah. thank you for that and i have all of that in the in the clear audience and 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 the one thing as as far as outside i mean i say it in the book too but setting your intent and really hearing getting getting that connection with the energy of your animal is where you want to start and then learn all of those steps, but setting that intention and really helping helping understand, looking through the animal's eyes, that's how you're gonna get, that's the best way to get started. Excellent. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for being on my little broadcast here on Facebook Live. It, it was a joy to, to actually have an in, you know, an intense, deep conversation and get to know you even better than, you know, in class, you know, it's always, hey, get a 10 minute break. Oh, God. Exactly. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate, appreciate uh, getting to know you better and appreciate you having me on.
Absolutely. Well, I will be in touch and I will uh, let's share this around so other folks can hear about the good work that you do. And uh, you have a good day. You too, my love. Stay well. You too. Bye-bye.